I'm very excited to be rounding out a very fantastic day. Um, I think we've touched on some of the topics that we'll cover today, uh, but hopefully have an opportunity to go deeper uh, into actually what's been happening inside these uh, four very diverse and different organizations, um, how the culture is being changed uh, there from bottoms up, from top down. Um, a bit about myself, so I'm a partner at a venture capital firm based here in the Bay Area. Uh, my connection to this cause and to Mindshare Partners, um, I mean, briefly, personally, I lost someone in my family to suicide. I realized as, a, as an adult that uh, emotional literacy was not part of my education growing up. And um, in my work, uh, we invest in early stage uh, startups. So you heard from uh, CEOs and founders uh, throughout the day. And uh, in 2017, 2018, I started to think about how, you know, as investors, we, as investors and as society, we place so much, uh, uh, such a heavy expectation and, and um, just, yeah, a big expectation on founders to create world-changing ideas, dis disruptive companies. Uh, we know that this is a, a very, very taxing journey with many, many ups and downs, but, you know, Largely, as an industry, we don't do enough to support uh, the people actually building these companies uh, through the journey. And so uh, in 2018, last fall, uh, one of the initiatives that we launched at our firm was uh, what we call our Founder Development Pledge. Uh, we commit 1% on top of every first check that we write in non-dilutive capital for founders to use uh, on themselves, so on executive coaching, therapy, anything that is going to help them through the journey. And so that's a bit about me and why I'm here, but excited to jump in with these four wonderful people. Um, so Cotter, maybe we'll start with you. It could be a good segue, uh, given you know, the startup. <laughs> yeah, so you know, in an article that you had written for the Mindshare Partners blog, Th Thrive Global Mindshare Partners blog, you had said that you know, one of your frustrations with company building generally is that um, many organizations, many founders seem to really value only the bottom line at the expense of employee well-being. And so when you started and founded Retail Me Not, you made a commitment from the beginning to really honor uh, your employees as the most valuable aspect of the business. So t tell us a bit about that journey and you know, in taking it from startup to IPO, how you were able to maintain that as a priority. Sure. Um, you know, I think it's one of those things that sounds good and it's easy to say, but like everything in life, it, it's hard hard to do and and it's even harder maybe when you're not as profitable as you once were or when you know you're not growing like you used to I mean we start out we grew you know 100 percent year over year for the first couple of years and of course you can do a lot then the investors all love you and everything you say is smart and you know you feel pretty even uh, that was a joke uh, but uh, <laughs> you know but then business gets a little tougher, and somebody says, well, why are we spending so much money on this, that, and the other? I think the other thing that happens, too, and, and I, I say this in San Francisco, so I, I think I know what I'm doing, is, you know, too often when we talk about employee welfare, it's you, you do the things that are easy. So it's free chips and cookies and stuff like that, or free lunch, um, as opposed to um, thinking about um, pay time off, and, and even as we've been talking about today, you know, sort of a, a, a realistic and, and sort of good approach to sort of mental health. Um, and that's harder. I mean, it's easier to buy chips. And so I think um, our journey was one where we started doing the easy things and then over time realized that while those were important, what really mattered were th the things that were harder. And so things like uh, making sure we had a great maternity, paternity policy. Um, and, and not just giving people time off, but also thinking about the things that would de-stress their lives and make it easier to return. And so we hired someone that would help you find um, childcare. 
Austin's where I'm from. Austin. Austin's a tough town right now for childcare. Um, it's I, mean, I, I realize I say this in San Francisco. It's super competitive. All these, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You laugh away. All, all these parents that are convinced that there's you know they got to fight for their kids, and I'm guilty of it too. And so so we we got someone to help them find um, childcare. And, and, and it, it's been a great service, and, and it's a, I've had a, a ton of employees come up to me and say, you know, this is something that I wouldn't have done for myself, but because it was free and here, I've used it, and it's been great. And they made me feel better about my choice, and I'm more sane that I'm coming back to work, and I feel like I'm doing good by my children and myself, too. And so that's like one tiny example of something I think you have to kind of work hard on and, and do, and there's you know, 100 more we should be doing. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll talk more about um, employee resource groups at Retail Me Not in a second. Um, but Jessica, I'd like to turn to you. Um, you have a background in clinical psychology, and now you are at Google. So tell us about your role there and what you're working on. Yeah, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and treated patients for about a decade. Um, but I do not treat any patients anymore, which is uh, kind of bittersweet. But I do love my new job where I work primarily on mental health strategy and directly supporting leadership to change business practices in support of employee mental health. And in addition, developing and running programs for targeted kind of interventions for employees focused on mental health specifically. So day to day, it's a lot of consultations, a lot of presentations, a lot of uh, training facilitation, looking at existing processes and finding ways to improve that and looking at tools, partnering with engineering teams and PM teams to improve tools focused on well-being internally. Um, and I think business practices is one of the places that's the most challenging but also has the biggest impact on kind of the day-to-day -day work that folks do. When I think of Google, I mean, we have many large companies represented here, but when I think about Google, I think about scale and size and resources and infrastructure. Was there anything you know, surprising or how has that affected your work? Yeah, that's a good question. I, scaling is especially difficult because we have folks across, of course, the whole world and the, the work stream is global support. And not only working against like, okay, here's a benefit, we get leadership to buy on, for example, to the benefit that we've suggested or a change in some kind of structure. But then implementing that globally becomes very challenging when you're working with different laws in different countries and different available availability of resources. Or for example, we need counselors that specialize in XYZ for every on-site clinic or for on-site clinics that have this kind of employee population. But then putting that into practice whenever there's a dearth of resources in a certain country is especially challenging, even with you know really high quality vendor partners. Um, so that is, is definitely hard. And then in regards to resourcing, we absolutely have more resources than anywhere I've ever worked before. I came from university health and then nonprofit before that. So as you can imagine, if we need the resources, there's ways to get it, but we still have to be very intentional and thoughtful and where we can have the most impact with the resources that we have because it's still not a, it's not a faucet that's just always on. And so thinking through what that's gonna look like, I mean, the pilot term was used before. That's a big, a big thing we do at Google. Lots of pilots, um, very data-driven, uh, both with quantitative and qualitative data, really listening to the people and kind of what they want, thinking about you know what groups are we not targeting with the, this approach, what groups are being missed and how can we also serve them. And so what's great is we can serve uh, kind of a smattering of different benefits that serve different people's needs, but we still wanna make sure that we're serving them with what's best in class and what's gonna be the most effective in a scalable and sustainable way. The sustainability piece is another one where somebody thinks of a great idea and they launch the program and it's awesome and gets really good feedback and how are we going to do it again? Because it's not built into the employee's role or it's not built into the infrastructure of the, of the company or the team. And so, yeah, there's a lot of challenges with a company of that size for sure. But I think really um, good challenges to have. Yeah, grass is always greener. So Michelle, turning to you, um, as I think many of us, myself included, um, have personal connections to this work and this cause. We'd love to hear about your journey to J&J &J and how the Mental Health Ambassador Program got started. Absolutely, I'm happy to, and very proud to be here to be able to share that story with you. 
So um, the story begins um, on our ERG that we have now in place at J&J &J for uh, mental health called the Mental Health Diplomats. Um, it started uh, several years ago, I would argue. Uh, we are fortunate uh, as a large company to have the ability to have a TEDx J&J &J stage where employees are invited to tell their stories. And myself, along with many other people, had the privilege to tell their story. Mine happened to be about growing up with my bipolar mother and what that experience was like to really humanize that for people and to open the dialogue in the workplace. Um, so that happened and the response to that was incredible, uh, so much so that I wrote my memoir <laughs> about what that experience was like in an effort um, not only to heal myself but also to use it as a vehicle to humanize mental health and really cause change around stigma. Uh, but the magic really happened shortly uh, thereafter with a colleague of mine who stood on the TEDx stage and shared a very um, personal story about his daughter. Uh, calling him, um, actually the police calling him to tell him that his daughter had attempted suicide. And after that talk, it was like all of these employees came out of the shadows and wanted to do something. They wanted, they felt a connection, they felt a pull, they felt um, an opening for them to share about their own experiences with mental health. Um, and so based on that, uh, the our ERG, the Mental Health Diplomats, was formed. Um, and so two years later, 1,000 employees across the globe in 30 chapters. It's probably gone up since I got that stat. Um, and with numerous events uh, focusing on World Mental Health Day, May, uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, has really caused a groundswell of employees to really um, you know, step forward and be catalysts for change when it comes to helping us be more accepting in the workplace. So um, we also have a remit within J&J, &J, uh, the 2020 Health Force, um, and we have our neuroscience leader, Husseini Manji, who's been quoted as saying, you can't have physical health without mental health. So we are all charged with, you know, focusing on our health and well-being, and mental health is now part of that. We also have a leader uh, within diversity and inclusion who is a huge crusader in uh, bringing our full selves to work, um, being boldly authentic in the workplace. Um, and we have employees who are demanding change. We had an employee who stood on the stage talking about bereavement, who said, you know, uh, why is it that I have paternity leave when a baby is born, but when my father died, I only was given a few days off, and that was a lifelong relationship. So, I mean, like, employees are demanding change in policies, which I think is really good. I can go on, so I'll just stop there. <laughs> we can come back to you. Let's make sure we cover it. But I'm just struck as Michelle is, is speaking about the theme of, you know, to echo the, the name of the prior panel, when, when a leader goes first, and a leader can be anyone, people come out of the shadows. I mean, when we announced the Founder Development Pledge at Felices that I mentioned, I mean, people came out of the woodwork, founders came out of the woodwork. It was very similar to what Jason was saying about his Fast Company article this morning. So it's just, it's so striking and it's so real. So turning to Vivek, uh, we heard from your colleague Nick earlier about all the groundbreaking things SAP is doing on the mental health front. And we spoke a little bit just a few minutes ago about just how it's taking shape internally. So we'd love to hear about, about that and about your role. Sure, so um, I'm in strategy for marketing and communications, and I wish I could tell you that what we're doing at SAP was some kind of a strategic, well-calculated series of moves. It actually was not. Um, it's been a bunch of coincidences that have all sort of laddered up to where we are today. Um, I think Kelly knows this story pretty well. Uh, we had invited Bill McDermott, who's our CEO. Uh, Nick and I had invited him to a, a dinner with some of the thought leaders uh, that we typically engage with in New York. And during the dinner conversation, uh, there were a few professors from Yale and Columbia who were talking about some of their recent work. And a lot of that work was focused around the topic of wellness and mental health. And so uh, Bill was really moved by the conversation and basically turns to me and says, we think SAP, given our position in the world and the, and the reach that we have, we need to take a leading position on this topic. Vivek, why don't you go out and research 
<laughs> and figure out what it is that we need to do. So needless to say, you know, um, <laughs> I started looking into it. Um, and so um, I looked into it in, in three different ways. The first one was, how did this topic actually resonate with me personally as an individual? And, you know, truth be told, I hadn't really thought about it too much. Um, you know, I grew up in India. Um, culturally, I think while there's lots of stigma associated with it, it's just any kind of anxiety, depression, sadness, whatever the case might be, it's supposed to be just, you know, just toughen up and it'll go away, right? So that's the kind of upbringing that you see in many of those types of cultures. Um, as a leader, I had witnessed um, many people, you know, in my team who had come to me with certain issues. And there's one, 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 um, one of my colleagues uh, whose mother had just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and she was going through a really, really tough time. There's another person whose uh, son had attempted to commit suicide um, twice in the last three years. So the more I thought about it, I saw how much I was personally exposed to it myself. There was some elements of it in my family as well. Um, so the topic resonated with me. And when I talked to a lot of people inside, the, inside of the company, I saw basically 1,000 points of light. So there are lots of different things going on. I talked with our chief medical officer who, uh, who told, told me about the programs that the company had put in place, you know, the standard traditional programs that you would see normally in a, in a big size company. Um, I talked to people in HR, talked to people in DNI. There wasn't a single owner. We'll come back to it. You know, there was no real sort of anybody. They, everybody said, it's, yes, it's important, but just go away and tell me when, once you figure it out, right? So it's not, uh, it's not a situation where there's a single owner or there's really a driving motivating factor within the business to make something happen, even if the CEO cares about it. I mean, that's the truth. Um, we also did a lot of research external to the company, and what we found was that there were some companies who had taken sort of what I would call um, spot positions on some topics. So whether uh, we talked to um, Ernst & Young, I think, in, in the UK, and they had done some work specifically because um, the, the Queen and you know, the Prince, Prince William, had a certain initiative around the topic. So that's basically what we found. And so in, I'll, we can go, uh, you know, I can talk forever as well, but I think, um, just long story short, the, we, we have identified basically a, a way for this topic to um, come together and bring together many different initiatives that we have within the company. We also decided very early on that if we spend a lot of our time trying to rally people and groups and business units inside the company, it wouldn't necessarily work because it's awfully hard to bring these groups together. So we want to take a public position on it by going external. And that's kind of part of the strategy, which is really counterintuitive for a big company, right? But we feel that the more external sort of um, positions we can take, the more places we can actually show up, because part of it, honestly, is showing up in conversations like this the more it's going to rally people inside of the company. So I'll just stop there, but we can, we can come back. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting approach um, and a good segue into, again, as, as Kelly and Jen and others have mentioned, there seems to be this, um, at least two approaches or two aspects uh, to this movement building. One is grassroots, bottoms up, and one is sort of the top-down, leadership-driven approach. So. You know, maybe this is a good segue back into ERGs, Cotter, if you want to start and just tell us about, you know, how that manifested at Retail Me Not. Sure. Um, I, I think our story is probably really similar to, to most in that we, we felt like we needed to do more around diversity and inclusion. Um, and it wasn't enough, you know, we, we have a very action-oriented approach to management. And, and you know, we had, had a, just a fear of saying we want to do something and then not actually empowering it or investing in it. And, and to me, that's like the worst thing you can do is pay lip service to something and then just sort of, oh, it's on the wall, you know. I mean, that's good enough. And so we, we put together a, a, a small team pilot program. No, I'm kidding. Uh, and, and, um, and they uh, they came back with this idea of, well, let's establish the, 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 an ERG 
um, uh, program. And so I'm sure like a lot of companies, we just sort of opened it up and said, who has an idea or a passion or an interest? And kind of overnight, we had, I think, seven or nine ERGs form just like that. We're about 500 people, so we're way smaller than a lot of my colleagues here. Um, and so, you know, but yet 20, 30 people would kind of come together and they range from um, ones for um, diversity, one, ones around sort of sexual, uh, or um, that's not right. Um, see? see? Yeah. Learning. Uh, but, but around different ways of thinking and, and just they span the gamut and it's really well done and um, it's been an excellent program and something I think that has gone from something that we really wanted to do just for us to becoming something that in Austin is pretty well known and people seek us out but and I think but you have to fight that in a way you know you don't want to make it part of your recruiting literature or anything like that per se. I mean, you don't do it for the recruiting, you do it because it's the right thing and then if people are drawn to it, well, that's great. And that's kind of where we are. I mean, I think we talk about it just enough, we don't talk about it too much and I don't know, maybe I'm overstating that, but I think, I think you want to be careful that you don't step into this sort of the role of, well, we do things so we can brag about them. Maybe that's just my sort of conservative approach, but but I think that's important. And, and um, people love them, and they've grown nicely. And if anything, they're more established today than they were a year ago. So that's exciting. Other thoughts, panelists? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I was just going to say I, I totally agree with this. Which is the worst thing you can do is actually make this some kind of a sloganeering activity. Yeah. And I think for us, showing up means showing up to learn rather than to promote, right? And, and, and so really that's the approach that we are following over the next six to eight months. I think what we'll go through is a pretty significant learning process. As we've seen today, there's so much that we've already learned. And I feel you know, that uh, we are on a cusp of a huge movement that's about to take shape, right? Over the next five years, I would say that this topic is only gonna yeah. you know, keep growing in importance. But I think the point that I think you're making as well is it's not about just sending a letter to your employees. It's not about writing something in the press. Mm -hmm. You have to have action that follows mm -hmm. and you have to enter it with a, with a learning mindset. So within our ERG, it's really about employees doing this for other employees. It's, it's, really, it's really like they caused this to happen and then leaders got on board and said, oh, well, look what they've created here. We're going to support it. And the beautiful thing about our ERG is we have like, I don't know, there's got to be like 10 subgroups within this mental health diplomat community that screams you're not alone. So the subgroups are postpartum depression, their depression, their PTSD, their eating disorder. So they're really relatable. If you are an employee and you you know, want more than the employee resources that are available, you could connect with your own colleague about a topic that you're like, you know, might be in a different division, but yet they get it. So it really is about, you know, you're not alone. We're there to support each other. It's really, you know, and then the secondary benefit to your point is like, yeah, like maybe we do show up as an employer of choice because we are inclusive, because we are having employees supporting each other in addition to EAP. Uh, we have an, uh, an ERG called the Blue Dot Group, which was um, Googler driven. Somebody came and said, we need a peer support system uh, for mental health, which we didn't have at that time. And um, the leadership has come on to support it and it's grown pretty big and a lot of people have signed up and they can be listeners to peers um, on relation to mental health issues. And you know that we have a tricks about for folks who want to sign up to do that, but they also put a blue dot on their work badge to show that they're willing to listen. It's kind of that nonverbal sign or signal that they're a safe person to talk to, maybe shifting that yellow that we talked about earlier to a green or a red to a, a yellow, um, which is cool. But also the Blue Dot Group, what's, they really champion mental health initiatives in their office location, which is cool. So we have like a Talks At series, it's on YouTube, Google Talks At, where they bring in guest speakers about all different kinds of 
um, thought leaders, and there's a mental health and wellness track. And so there was recently one done about suicide, you know, and so they can bring in whatever they want and the company will support bringing that in. But we also earlier, somebody were talking about the diversity inclusion also needs to include mental health, which is really important. So we also have ERGs that are not necessarily mental health focused, they're diversity focused, like the Black Googler Network, who does lots of programming focused on mental health, which is awesome. And so there's a lot of traction for like black mental health events. And those are really, really successful and people really enjoy them and feel that they finally have a space to you know, talk up. Talk, speak up and connect with others. So it's cool to see that too. So Jessica mentioned uh, sustainability earlier, and you know, in, in another way, I, th I believe Cotter said, you know, we don't want to get into the place of launching something and then not being able to maintain it or support it, um, or or even maybe make a commitment but not take action. So it, I think, these issues of measurement, which Jessica also talked about, and accountability. Um, in, in my mind, are very related to this, right? Uh, we often say you can't manage what you don't measure. Um, my question is, who, who is accountable? I mean, Vivek alluded to the fact that in his organization, it's sort of a shared responsibility, but who's accountable? How do you set the metrics for success? How do you know what to measure? Uh, and how do you adjust course? I mean, really, let's get into kind of the tactical, you know, when you're in it, you know, not everything will go as planned, but you know, what's actually happening day to day? Wow, that's a tough question. So who's, who's accountable? I used to have a different view on this, but the more I've researched the topic, I feel like ultimately leaders are accountable. It's not the HR department, it's not DNI programs, it's none of that. I think ultimately anybody who has a team, anybody who's a colleague, anybody you know who participates as part of multiple teams, um, I think is responsible. And I, I don't think, I, I don't mean leaders in the traditional sense. I mean every one of us has the ability to lead on this topic. And I think this point was made earlier um, as well. Now, where the culture comes in, and this is where the top level leadership of the company comes in, in, into play and some of the programs come into play, is can you actually create a psychologically safe environment for those conversations to happen? Because that, to me, is the crux of the issue, right? Um, and, and if you can do that, then I think the way you measure it, again, you know, you don't necessarily, in my view at least, personal opinion, you don't measure it um, in terms of quotas or how many people you, you know, quote, saved, right? I mean, you, you have to look into really performance at the end of the day, you know, because if we truly believe that these types of programs and this type of culture benefits company performance, then to me, that's the only, you know, that's the way you, you need to look at it. But I, I mean, I have a, I, I'll be honest, I mean, I probably have the least informed view on this particular point than anybody else in this room. So it's just my personal opinion. Uh, we also have shared accountability for these, for these initiatives and mental health initiatives tend to be driven by benefits, but it's not unheard of for a leader to step forward and say, I want mental health to be a focus. And we find that when there's a cross-functional effort, it's much more successful. And in that cross-functional effort, we create shared OKRs so that we all have kind of skin in the game. We all are accountable to this, and we're all going to be driven and motivated to meet that goal together as a team. So it's not just benefits. It's also other parts of HR, uh, even security and ruse and the different parts of the business um, Communicate, you know, executive communications, we all have done multiple projects where this has really shown to be successful, which is really cool. Um, yeah, I, I, this is an interesting one. Um, this is in a personal opinion. I'm not representing Retail Me Not when I say this. <laughs> but um, in my opinion, I don't always love sometimes when we say, well, it helps the business too, or it improves profitability. I think we owe it to each other sometimes just to do the right thing. And so often we don't and we fail. And, and so to me, one of the reasons we launched into DNI was because it was the right thing. And I kind of didn't care if it made us more profitable or grew sales. It was the right thing for us to do. We weren't reflecting um, our community. 
and um, I felt like we should. Oh. So I'll just add here too, it is a shared responsibility at J&J. &J. We have a, a leadership team that I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of where we set the strategy for what we're out to accomplish, whether it's cultural uh, shifts or community outreach. We try really hard to raise money for nonprofits uh, throughout the year, but each of the individual chapters also have their own sponsor which is a great way to in, engage and have senior leaders um, really helping to drive change within the culture um, because they're the ones that have the ability to create space on their annual meetings, town hall meetings, to elevate the conversation. So it's shared in that we have um, our leadership team driving it, but then also the different sponsors and the business within those 33 global chapters. You also asked about data and measurement a bit, and everybody knows Google is very data-driven, um, and that tends to work in our benefit, but we also have to be very intentional about how we look at the data and making sure we're looking at the right measurements of success. And when we talk about mental health, that gets really tricky, because we could say, I mean, in the example, EAP utilization was dropping, and we could say, oh, people are getting healthier. Well, probably, maybe not. You know, maybe there's a barrier of access to care. Um, or if we look at leave of absences dropping, right? Is that a measurement of success? That's a measurement we probably don't even want to consider because we don't want to discourage folks from taking leave who really need to take leave. We want to really empower them to be able to do so. And so if we are held to that measurement, then we might be driving the wrong initiatives for having kind of um, unintended consequences. Um, and so it's, it's important we think through that from a really holistic sense and looking at people data in a very sensitive way and also looking at cross sections of that data to ensure we're not missing somebody in the process. Because there may be a subset of the pop, if 90% of the population is accessing service and we go great and they're getting healthier, but 10% and it's a certain saline identity is going in the wrong direction, we're probably not doing our jobs, we're not being inclusive and that's a huge miss. And so we have to look at that data and different cuts and different intersectionalities as well. As well, excuse me. Yeah, and I imagine it's different for every company, right? Like the specific data, I guess, sort of has to fit. And your answer also made me think of just having establishing a process to revisit and look at the data and question, you know, are we still tracking the right things? Yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, it, this is probably, in my mind, at least, one of the most difficult questions to address. But then you look at the flip side, right? And you say, well, how do you measure some of the things that we talked about earlier today? Courage, vulnerability, right? Um, you know, how do you measure those things? Kindness, how do you measure it? There is nothing to measure it. And I think um, you can reward the right behavior, so I'd much rather um, create a culture where those types of things are actually recognized by leaders and rewarded, as opposed to saying, I'm going to set this type of a bar, or here's a quota for doing certain things. And so I, I, my view is that this has got to be more of a, um, uh, it's, it's got to be much more of an attributes and a character-driven conversation, a values-driven conversation, than a performance, you know, hard metrics-oriented conversation. The hard metrics will tell you something, but to your point, yeah. you, you, can, you can look at them, you know, any way that you want. This leads me to the question of um, what does success look like? I mean, do we even know what a mentally health, men, mental health supportive culture or a mentally healthy workforce looks like? Um, is it a destination? Does it change? What are your thoughts on that? It was, certainly for me, it's not a destination. I don't think there's an end point to mental health. Um, I think about it, you know, diversity. 10, 15 years ago in the business, it was like, can we check off these quotas and these, look, we have the headcount we need. That's not diversity. We know today, even though we, most companies have a long way to go, in regards to diversity, we know it's more of an integrated, inclusive culture, making sure that we're thinking about diversity with every business decision that we make. And there's probably always somebody that we're missing, so we can always learn more, and it's a new learning and a new journey every single day. I think it's the same thing for mental health. Once we kind of say, okay, yes, people are getting healthier, but there's always somebody that's gonna be struggling. This is just life. 
Um, there's always going to be death. There's always going to be difficult times. There's always going to be things that cause stress and impact folks for whatever reason, fill in the blank. Look how many of us stood up earlier today. And with that, it's something that we're continually learning and continue developing and continuing to enhance so that we continue to reach more people and go deeper into this space, including how we do business, how we engage with each other, how we talk, how we lead, how we serve. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think I, I, my gut is is that we'll, you know you can't ever declare victory in something like this, but you can take hope from, I mean, I love, I didn't even know this before we set up here, but I love the thing you said about your firm putting money into uh, the founders uh, sort of well-being, for lack of a better word, or I'm sure you said it better, but um, <laughs> that's so lovely. And, 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 and we all know how hard it is to put money, I mean, it's to write a check and say, here's the, the that's amazing, so congrats, and, and I love, you know, a lot of the stories we've heard today, the survey was, was so impressive, and I'm eager to see that. And so to me, it feels like we're making nice progress. I mean, obviously, things would be better, but, you know, as long as you're kind of heading the right way, you, you take hope from that. I don't know, things like this. You know? I would just add that, you know, for, for us at J&J, &J, we have our credo, and our credo is really um, our North Star, and every year we measure our employees' experience against our credo, and our credo actually calls us to put the well-being of our employees. We actually added uh, some words to our credo recently, but I think that that's our barometer, is what is our employees' experience like, and are we continually improving that? Are we, con you know, creating a space for them to be who, to be the best version, to bring their full selves to work, to to feel like their um, invisible and, and visible disabilities are respected and there's a place for them? So I think that, for us, that's our measurement, you know, at the end of the day. So I was just going to say, I think for us, I think, well, first of all, I don't think there's one measure and I don't think there's a single destination, but there are success markers. I'll give you one quick example, uh, which is uh, about two years ago, uh, we launched a training program for employees around mindfulness. And it turns out that the mindfulness training program is the highest subscribed program at SAP for employees, you know? And, and that, to me, is one directional indicator that we're doing some things right, you know? Um, so, again, you know, you're going to have some directional markers. There are some, you know, potential areas that you can see some successful engagement. I think engagement is probably the word here, but it's not one single destination. Any particular challenges or, you know, things, issues that you're thinking through right now, anything that's specifically top of mind? Um, Jessica's laughing. She's like, where do you want me to start? <laughs> I know. I think, well, because it's 100% of my job, you know, there's always going to be challenges that I try to embrace and think of as new learning opportunities every day. Um, I mean, we talked about scalability and sustainability earlier. And so for me, stepping back and instead of just jumping in and saying, this is a great solution, thinking through that scalability and sustainability from the beginning and getting that leadership buy-in and the right resourcing uh, helps it go much faster and making sure we have quarterly goals and quarterly check-ins, but still being flexible to adapt as time goes on so that you're not stuck in that place. Because you know, if you get really attached to this is the solution and we can't change it even though the business wants it a little differently or this, you know, this team, it's not quite fitting, then it might fall flat. Um, and so change is, is inevitable, and embracing that change, as difficult as it can be, especially when you have to scrap your whole project and, you know, after six months in. Uh, but it's also really rewarding, because there's, at least for me, there's new, new learning every time, so that the next iteration is going to be better and it's going to be stronger. So I'm just going to be brutally honest. <laughs> If that's okay. I think that one of the biggest challenges that there, there is within my company, and I would venture to say in others, is, is the, um, the fact that our middle managers and our, our leaders across the organization are the face of the company. And that experience that an employee has with their leader is everything. So I, I think that it, 
you know, we are offering you know, mental health awareness training, mental health first aid training, and I just think that as an organization, until we get to the point where we have all of our our people leaders uh, embracing mental health and and you know, because you can say be boldly authentic, but if they don't feel safe, it it's not going to matter. I think that is is going to be something that there's always room for improvement in. Um, I think the thing we, we talked about it once today, but you know, if a lot of if a lot of this starts with communication, and this is kind of what you were just saying in a way, um, we're working a lot on just basic communication skills with managers, and and not just in this area, but you know, it spans so much more. And I think that's the a foundation that we could be better at. Yeah, I think for us it's um, awareness within the employee community that it's okay to have these conversations, but at the same time in parallel, develop the right kind of leaders. And I love the point you made about middle management. I think that's super important. Uh, and for us, uh, it's the top brass of the company as well, right? Because I think um, when the top brass, the top executives of the company basically are willing to talk about it say it's important, then everything kind of falls into place. And there's enough people within the employee community who want that help, but it's, you got to send the right signal. So. I'll ask one more uh, question, and then we can go to audience questions, so please think of some. So when I was speaking with Jessica right before this, um, I asked her, you know, is there someone in a role similar to yours at other you know, comparable companies, and she was like, no, and I said, what about this one? She said, no, what about this one? So I, the question just occurred to me is, um, do you think there will be more uh, Jessicas, and perhaps even a chief, you know, a head of mental health, fill in the blank? I mean, I'm thinking back to the parallels with GNI, or, or not, it's a prediction question. Uh, yes, I do think roles such as mine are going to blow up in the next five years. There's a lot of reliance right now on external um, experts mm -hmm. for this kind of work, and so that's the work I was doing for Google. Part of this role, I was a consultant externally um, through their employee assistance program, and they realized as they continued to rely on me more for strategy and some of this other support, they needed a role like this, and then in, you know invited me to apply, and then luckily I got the job. Um, and Looking at that, if you start looking across other companies, there are clinical psychologists focused on highly targeted interventions, like Facebook, I believe, has a team that supports folks who review sensitive content, for example, and I think Twitter just posted a similar role for a clinical psychologist um, to come on and do something similar at Twitter. Uh, and But most of the other companies I know, it's folks that come in as advisors on the boards um, for mental health focus. Salesforce has a, somebody on their board of advisors who's a mental health expert for example, um, but bringing that internal, I think there's more impact. I'm embedded in the business, I see the day-to-day, -day, and I, even the feedback I get from some of the leadership is like, wow, we had people we could you know, consult with before, but there was something missing, or it's not, the initiatives weren't driven in the same way. And so I do think, I hope, <laughs> I hope more of me will exist. You know, it's not fun to, <laughs> to, uh, work in a vacuum, but luckily I have a huge team, and while they're not clinical psychologists, they're very, very smart people, very informed, who also help drive mental health initiatives. And yeah, we're a huge company that has a ton of resources who can dedicate you know, a good number of folks to these kind of work streams, but I do think in time, especially with some of the data we talked about before that was shown, um, from the keynote, we're gonna see more folks investing in this space. I think hopefully it's because it's the right thing to do and it's a human-centered approach, but basically it also it just impacts the bottom line in the long run. Any other predictions? It's okay if not. Okay, any questions out there? Uh, yeah, Google definitely collects both quantitative and qualitative and uses the qualitative and codes that to find certain themes to ensure that they're looking at exactly why that rating is a certain way. Um, so it's definitely a mixture of both. And even in, when I first started my role, I did an incredible amount of discovery where I was 
kind of, I do a lot of shadowing. I do meetings with, directly with leaders and key folks who have a good sense of what's going on in the company to do interviews, and that is incredible. That's all qualitative to help inform strategy and direction to ensure things are gonna land the right way with the business. Because you're right, hard data only gives you so much. You also have to use practical application and common sense. <laughs> Um, and so the qualitative helps to flavor the other side of things, for sure. So maybe just to add on to what, what you said, um, yes, we measure, you know, how many people call the EAP program and, you know, how many people ask for help. Uh, but what, what we have started doing is, uh, within our corporate portal, we've started actually writing stories um, where employees are talking about some of the stuff that they've seen, they've experienced, and we look at the engagement of those types of things. And what we found is, again, like I've said earlier, there's just so much interest in this topic. Um, we also tested out a little bit, um, you know, on the social media externally as well to see how this topic resonates uh, and how we can be more authentic in terms of joining conversations that are already going in this space. So we're doing a little bit of testing along those lines. Um, just, and of course, qualitative input is always there. I mean, we know how many people in fact, I mean, there's evidence that people's lives were saved uh, through the course of p calls that they made into a particular line, and that there are certain stories. Obviously, we're not going to say who it was, but um, but we have those types of stories available. But I think storytelling is the biggest hack in this space, and that's what we're looking at. There's one other question. Great question. Yep. I can speak to part of it. Coincidentally, I was when I was a consultant, I helped to craft kind of the protocol and guidelines for the group, but I was not involved in getting the vetted approval through HR and legal because I was an external person at the time. But um, the Blue Dot group has three levels, and I can't, I'm going to butcher the names of the three levels, so I apologize, but it's like folks who are just interested in learning more and kind of being champion, folks who are interested in like driving programming for the group, and driving mental health initiatives, and then the top level are the listeners. And the listeners do have to go through a specialized training comparable to mental health first aid, like how to be a listener, um, in order to, to get that vetted approval of being a listener for mental health stuff. And they get a lot of coaching and guidance on where the boundaries are, and when and how to refer to professional support, because we don't want somebody to um, rely on that in lieu of professional support, but we definitely want that to be an additional outlet, and so the two really complement each other. I saw one more question, yes. So I can, I can talk to some of that. I'm sure you guys could probably speak to more of it. What I can tell you is we're sort of still new in the ERG space, right? So one of the things we learned last year is that we had champions at the senior level, and then we had this amazing groundswell of employees the gap was the people in between. <laughs> and so that's when we set out and said, okay, well, we're gonna offer mental health first aid as optional, but then what about mental health awareness training, like sensitivity training, like don't look away if you see something is going on with your staff, and that's where we are right now. So I can't really give you like practical examples, except for we've identified that that's a focus. We, we really need to empower and educate them so they could support our staff. Oh, sorry. Um, I loved your line about storytelling as a hack. That's a, I'm stealing that for sure. I, I won't give you credit. It's, it's <laughs> so great. Um, but that's how we tried to push that into the org, is we use specific examples that we talk about over and over and over again. So I'll give you a quick one. Um, when we went public, we very much didn't want to take 12 executives and stand on the little balcony at the New York Stock Exchange. We made the NASDAQ come to Austin and we rang the bell as a bunch of employees together, not this little tiny elite group and, you know, that went to New York. And, and we talk about that over and over and over again because it sends a nice signal that we're all in this together Everybody matters, you know, it's not just the executive team or whatever. And I even resist labels like E-team and stuff like that, but they just keep creeping back in. Um, nonetheless, uh, that's how we do it, is we literally repeat stories that try to set a tone that we want. And, you know, I think it's a going okay, so. But that's a, that's a great line. 
banks. Well, I also love, I mean, the story that you told about NASDAQ, and yeah. invi that's, uh, that's unbelievable, because it comes back to, I think, what's on the subtext of the poster behind us, right, which is this is a culture thing. And you can, I mean, how many of us have suffered through training programs where you have to take some kind of a poll online, you're multitasking half the time, and you're hoping that it goes away, right? It, it's just, and you complete it, you get the check mark. But this training for this type of an activity has to be treated completely differently than many of the traditional activities. And so, you know, um, I don't know if there's a single way of doing it, but in my mind, just to, to your point, Carter, right? It's just how telling those stories and holding examples of people who've gone above and beyond, who've done these types of things in practice, and really respecting and valuing their work, I think is the way to do it. I agree with a positive reinforcement piece. Like before we can hold managers accountable, we have to make sure they're equipped to take care of themselves. Talk about you know, putting on your own oxygen mask before you can help others. If managers don't have the right support infrastructure in place, not just benefits resource-wise, but also infrastructure-wise, we're kind of shooting in the dark to kind of then criticize them for maybe not being the best people manager. Um, and then we have to equip them, like you're, I agree, you were saying, with the right tools and skill sets so and making sure they have the right trainings available, the right talking points available, uh, guidelines on how to support their teams. If they don't have the tools, it's like giving somebody the SAT who's never been to high school. It's probably a hard test to pass. Um, and then and only then do we start to look at hypothetically holding them accountable, but I definitely agree with the positive reinforcement piece because figure out what their strengths are, we can continue to highlight those and so for them to do it even more, <laughs> I think that'll be probably a better course. Okay, any final questions? Yes. I'll take a quick uh, perspective. So one of the things, and Mike, I think, had to leave, unfortunately, but one of the things that we're doing is um, surveying the mental wellness of our employees during really hard weeks, like the one that we just are heading into. Um, just a spot poll, you know, we just get a sense. And I find that um, just even responding to that survey sends a good signal that the company cares about you, and it also makes you a little more introspective about what's actually going on. So that's just one small example of what, what it is that we've just started doing. Uh, we'll likely continue to, you know, extend all of that. And we've also incorporated a lot, lot of these types of things into some of our core products. As you know, SAP, you know, we, uh, we're in many, many businesses within the HR function. And so we've just launched a new index with Thrive Global, um, which is called Thrive Global, Thrive XM, I think. And what we're trying to do is to um, come up with a way to measure the state of wellness in general, across multiple dimensions, across the workplace. So it's going to be a global index. We're going to announce the results at the end of the year. And you know, hopefully this conversation will lead into the World Economic Forum at Davos next year. I think you're um, to, for a question about kind of addressing sort of unconscious bias maybe directed towards mental health. We try to incorporate that in a lot of the mental health trainings that are offered um, to a certain extent. I think they're always kind of balancing, like, how much time do you have for a training with how much content you're trying to get in, which is another challenge. Um, but definitely that the reducing stigma is done not only through trainings, but also through executive communications as well as um, signage, kind of uh, campaign, mental health campaigning, things like that. And at J&J, last year, we did launch uh, an official unconscious bias training out of our Office of Diversity and Inclusion that has taken taken a hold, um, which is great. And then we also have vignettes we do. In addition to the TED stage, there's vignettes that a lot of employees who are courageous enough do. And then the thousand employees who are the ERG members are also equipped with an engagement deck. So they get, they seek out opportunities at different staff meetings to talk and to promote all of the goodness that this ERG is doing. Um, if you're lucky enough to get that time. Like I have a presentation next week. They gave me 15 minutes. I just found out I have 10. So, so but no, but I'm gonna make the most of that 10 minutes. And, and I'm just grateful that that leader found it a little bit important, you know what I mean? So, baby steps. <laughs>
Well, that's a great place to end. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing where each of your organizations goes with this cause. And thank you for doing this important work. So please join me in thanking. Thank you.